may be seated. Brothers and sisters, welcome to Brother Jim Sandler's funeral service. My name is Bishop Davis. I will be officiating uh, the funeral service today. I just wanted to thank Brother Caleb Sanders for our family prayer that we had earlier. It was beautiful. Also for Sister Pam Mayo as our organist. Uh, she's been playing the prelude music. Our chorister today is going to be Sister Soraya Sanders. We will I'll go through the program before we get started. We're first going to start with an opening hymn, which is Love is Spoken Here. The words are on the back of the program uh, if you need them. Our invocation, our opening prayer, will be by Brother Ben Sanders, after which the life sketch will be given by Marjorie Sanders Holcomb, as well as Robert Sanders. After that, we'll have a clarinet solo by Sister Soraya Sanders, Bring Him Home. And Caleb Sanders will read a scripture, after which Jocelyn Sanders will provide us with a, pro a poem. And we'll have another musical number by Lorraine Bolton, Near My God to Thee. And then Aaron will speak to us I don't see him right here. There you are. <laughs> I was looking everywhere else. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Aaron will speak to us, after which I'll provide a couple of remarks. And Brother Ben Sanders will give us a solo, Amazing Grace. And our benediction will be given by Jason Sanders. We'll start with our congregational hymn, Of Love is Spoken Here. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> no, you can start there. Thank you. 
Our kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather as friends and family in memory of my, my father, James. We ask that you watch over my mom and let her know that we, she has all the support she needs to get her, help guide her through the hard times and trials that she's here to have. And that she's always loved, as they both have taught us, that love is always with the family. We ask that when the time comes that we can all travel to the cemetery for his final resting place in safety. May I say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. I'm Marty Hope, Sanders Holcomb. And I grew up, I was the only girl surrounded by three mischievous, energetic brothers who turned out to be really amazing. Ross was the oldest, Jim, then me, and David. My dad was in the military for 22 plus years, and he served in the, during World War II in the Army Air Corps. After the war ended, he got out and they moved to uh, Minnesota, and things were just different. And so, he decided to rejoin the service and he joined the Air Force. And so I am proud to say that my brothers and me were all brats. My Ross and David finished 20 plus years in the military and my husband also finished 20 plus years in the Air Force. Unfortunately, Jimmy was unable to join the military or he would have. Uh, my parents were sightseers. They like to embrace all new in, in, environments, museums, and experience. And they always said life is an, an adventure and you had to morph to fit the situation. You had to survive. One such adventure heard, happened real early in Jim's life when they lived in Montana. They decided to go to the mouth of the Mississippi River. Mom said it was at that point a small creek and it was way up north and people were walking around, taking pictures, and having a great time. Toddler Jim decided that he was going to jump over the river so he could say, I jumped over the Mississippi River. And his little legs were not strong enough and he landed in the river and mom said, 
many years later that he was covered in mud and water. Jimmy was always precocious and always smart. And this was manifest in an adventure he had when we lived in Japan. In 1950, dad went over to Japan before the Korean War really started up. Mom was left in Mississippi, in uh, Montana, no, in Minnesota. And she was very pregnant with me. She had Jim and she had Ross, but her orders never came for her to go to Japan. So finally she said, well, the heck with this, I'm gonna write President Truman. And she did. And President Truman sent a telegram saying, you're going to be on the last ship that's going to ship out with military dependents to Japan. Mom says, that's what you get for speaking up for yourself. So they got on the ship and Ross remembers it very well because he got to eat all the desserts he could and mom let him. So uh, when they got to Japan, they lived in a town called Tachikawa. Uh, Dad was stationed at Kota. That's when the military bases were here and the civilian population was over here, the dependents. And so we lived in Tachikawa and he built one of the first American houses in that little subdivision. And they were very proud of their little American house there. And it had a white fence around it. Well, one morning early, Jim decided he was gonna escape. And he was only two something years old and he escaped in diaper and t-shirt. And he joined the group of folks that were walking down the road going to the train station. Well, you know, there's nothing better than the train station when you're a little kid. And I'm sure he stood there watching, seeing what everyone was doing. And he said, well, I can do that. So he got on the train and he went to Tokyo. <laughs> so when he got to Tokyo, the military police snatched him up because this blonde headed, fair skinned kid was definitely not Japanese. So they knew he had to be as one of the dependents. In the meantime, mom was back at Tachikawa, very upset, and they looked frantically everywhere. And for two days, two days, they could not find Jim. I cannot imagine the anguish that my mom felt. Finally, on day two day plus, the Stars and Stripes ran a photo of this toddler, cute little toddler in diapers and a t-shirt, eating an ice cream cone, sitting on the desk. He was quite happy and content. And the photo caption I'm sure read, who is this little fellow? The MPs took great care of him. He was happy, he was entertained, he ate lots of sweets, and he reluctantly left his new kingdom and went home. The thing about mom and dad, they somewhat embraced this independent, bold behavior. There was only a talking to, and I could just see dad shaking his head, oh my gosh, what has he done now? Uh, and using better control for Jimmy. I likened it to free range upbringing. We were always able to run free. We could come home at lunch, eat lunch, run free some more, and it was very safe at that time. There were lots of stay at home moms. They were watching and reporting. So our moms knew what we were doing anyways. After Japan, our next duty station was Denison, Texas, where David was born. We lived in a real small house and had three bedrooms. Ross and Jim had one bedroom, David and I had one, and our parents had one. And to the left of the house was a retaining wall. And down below was a swing set. And Ross, who was about 12 at the time, would stand on top of that retaining wall. And I was standing there watching him. And he would jump, grab hold of the swing set and swing and fall to the ground. Well, Jim, who was about six at that time, decided he could do that too. So he did, he jumped, he missed, and it was exciting chaos to see him withering on the ground. It was awesome. Well, back then they put plasters on broken arms and Jim got one and he thought that was really cool. And what a weapon that was. Around 1953, we had this new invention called a TV. And my dad was always big on electronics. And so he went and bought a small console black and white TV. Wow, we had cartoons <laughs> and Davy Crockett and Art Linkletter. And it was just amazing. Well, Jim fell in love with the TV and he developed square eyeballs, which he had all his life. 
And he loved the cartoons and he loved the Three Stooges. And later on, Rocky and Bullwinkle. I think that is where he developed his strange sense of humor, watching those guys. And I never could understand his strange humor. So he was pretty persistent. So to combat that, I would turn to harass him in other ways. So one day I sang the Davy Crockett theme song all day long. Well, by the time dad came home, Jim was sick and tired of me singing the Davy Crockett theme song. He said, make her stop. So dad said, okay, that's enough. You need to stop. So I did. You know, my mom always said there was more than one way to skin a cat. And so, you know, we had to figure things out on our own. Another subtle way that I would get Jim's goat without touching him because he was always doing stuff to me was he had been particularly pesty this day. And at six o'clock, we always had dinner and we'd sit down to dinner and I sat across from him and he'd been harassing me all day. So I said, okay. I sat across from him and I stared at him and I ate. And I didn't take my eyes out of him. I didn't close my eyes, I just stared at him. And finally, the minute, the second seemed like minutes. And he said, dad, make her stop. And dad who sat to the right of me said, okay, that's enough, stop. So I did, but it was awesome. <laughs> Our dad was a kind and loving, understanding dad that supported independent, out-of-the-box thinking. And if you talk to my brothers, they were all independent and very out-of-the-box. And mom and dad were on the same page that way. As you well know, siblings are competitive, right? And they can subtly, sub, subtly, sub, subtly uh, agitate each other where parents don't even know about it. And when there's four of us acting like that, it was sometimes pretty chaotic. Well, Jim was super smart in school. He could easily learn a lot, but for many years he was, well, pretty obnoxious, you know? But that turned to be an asset later on in life because it kept him focused on what he wanted to do and what he believed in. And so that became his asset. And Jim was who he was and we accepted him and we accepted each other. So it was just kind of an interesting busy house. But one day, Jim really punched my mom's buttons, which he could do easily. And she looked at him and he said, you will either be famous or infamous, but it is up to you to decide which you're going to be. So we've all thought about that comment because it's a real interesting com comment. Personally, we all have challenges, right? Everyone challenges are different while growing up, but we are all children of God and we are all on different pathways. Jim's pathway has been hard, with many obstacles and challenges that his siblings didn't even have to face. But Carol has always been the tiller of the boat. She accepted Jim for what he was. She supported him. She helped him to inspire him to reach for the stars. And finally, after 40 plus years of learning, he figured it out. And he became a ballistic rocket in managing finances managing his life, understanding his love of God. And with Carol, he started the Hypothyroid Association. Jim and Carol and later Julie Hunsaker became a powerhouse trio. And we all have them to thank for what they did with the association. My brother Ross would have been here along with Linda, except Ross had a medical emergency and he's now in rehab and he is watching this from his bed in Florida. On one of the announcements, he posted this, quote, Jim was my hero, only I was not aware of it until it was almost too late. And then came the family scourge that impacted all of us, but none worse than Jim, who rose up and created a powerful weapon that brought the plight of millions to the attention and care of the powerful. Finding a cure became a mission of many working 
many working together because Jim's passionate efforts. Well done, my brother, my hero. I think we all feel the same way. All is well with Jim. He's not in pain. He's, he's at peace with our Heavenly Father, our parents, our baby brother Billy, who passed away at nine months when he was in 1946. Jim was an exceptional person. I kind of wish, I wish I had known him later in life. Bob's gonna tell us what he did later in life. And I didn't know 90% of it. I knew bits and pieces of it, but I didn't know the impact. God be with all of us today. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let's see if I could get through this. I'm Bob Sanders. I'm the middle child of Jim and Carol. Just want to thank my Aunt Margie for your kind words. Um, just want to talk uh, talk to you about the mountain of the man that my dad was. Uh, not only for our family, but as you'll see, for literally thousands of people around the world, and we got a front row seat to see this 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 change. My dad met my a beautiful young lady. In 1969, on Halloween night, three months later, no, two months later, 60 days, on uh, New Year's Day or New Year's Eve that day, he married my mom. They've been together ever since, 54 years. It would have been 55 this year. Together, they had myself, uh, Jason, Ben, Stephen, and Aaron. And I just kind of wanted to talk to you guys about some of the values that dad instilled on all of us boys uh, growing up and some of our friends as well. And some of those values, I'm just going to kind of start off uh, in what arrives. So faith. So dad was a profoundly religious man, rooted strongly in the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saint. He served as word clerk for multiple bishoprics throughout the years. I want to say three, and then I was talking with Bishop Monick last night, and then we remembered Bishop Alder. So I, I, I kind of lost track, but it was easily probably 20 plus years serving as a word clerk. Uh, he placed God at the center of our home, and that was his highest priority. He would take us to church every Sunday without fail. We'd have family prayers in the mornings and before leaving on trips. Monday mornings were family home evenings if he was home. He made sure that we were involved in scouts and mutual. We'd go out, collect fast offerings. He would take us with him when he went home teaching. If there was an opportunity to serve, we would be there. This could be anything from mowing the brother and sister Clark's lawn, which really wasn't, I mean, it was work, but they gave us cinnamon rolls in return, so it was okay. And she made the best cinnamon rolls. <laughs> to working on the church farm and pitching fences and everything in between. He would often reward us with Papa, Tom, Papa Tom's afterwards. That was his favorite pizza. We'd go to a priesthood session as young men during general conference and invite all the young men that were there. And we'd go to Papa Tom's as well. His favorite pizza was pepperoni and pineapple with red pepper flakes. But his testimony was the rock that he was our rock until we were able to form our own. He never stopped serving the Lord, and he always had a smile on his face. When he retired from work, along with the, the Hypoparathyroidism Association, he didn't stop serving. He switched gears, he started indexing and almost attending the, the temple daily. Doing, and the work continued. He just shifted. As his, his health got worse and he slowed down, focused more on the indexing and the things that he could handle. But he never stopped serving the Lord. It's been profoundly impactful on my life. And then that starts going into family as the other value. Having a family and having some and having a home centered around God go hand in hand. Dad worked a lot, often picking up as much overtime as he could. He always provided for our family. We never went without, but we always had everything that we needed. If there's anything extra, he taught us boys that we had to go earn it. Um, that included chores, mowing bonds, whatever, right? Um, 
Everything he did was to provide, protect, and serve his family. We didn't go on a lot of vacations, but when we did, they were memorable. I recall that on one occasion, he took us out to a lake that I couldn't remember. Jason swears it's Henry's Lake Bed, says it's Rival Reservoir. I'm not sure. I was pretty young. We went fishing. We got up really early in the morning so we could get bait in the water as, as the sun was coming up. Fishing was slow and not a lot of fun for a bunch of rambunctious, impatient boys. And there's this little pond off to the side of the lake. Jason noticed it and said, hey, the fish are jumping over there. So dad gathered all of us up and said, let's go fish over there. And then fishing was hot. We limited out. Well, then the fish cops came and said, hey, you can't fish there. Turns out that the pond that we were fishing in was a fish hatchery or the fish were spawning or some for some reason. But we weren't able to fish there nonetheless. So he had a stern talking to with dad, but somehow dad convinced him to let's keep the fish. And uh, But we had to be done and we were done for the day. So we just went home and, and that night we had trout for dinner. Dad loved his grandchildren. I think he loved them more than he did us. He would do anything for them. Anytime they came to visit, his face would light up with joy. When the kids came over, he it gave them an excuse to get, go get a snack, go get an ice cream. He loved the buffets, especially when that, that new pizza slash pasta buffet opened up down the road. Man, he went over there all the time. <laughs> Sleepovers turned into movie nights filled with cheesy movies and popcorn. To him, it was all about family and making sure that we were all taken care of. <laughs> And then he had commitment and integrity with some of the other values that he instilled in us. So dad understood the importance of commitment. When you say you will do something, you must follow through. He made sure that we understood that we were only as good as our word and that we would be judged on our actions and our deeds. We had responsibilities to fulfill before we were allowed to play outside, watch TV, nothing crazy, just doing dishes, cleaning the house, mowing the lawn, etc. But as boys, we did everything we could to get out of the, get out of the chores. One night I'll never forget it was the night that my dad cut the power cord to the TV. He had asked Ben and I, Jason reminded me last night that he was there, but I don't remember. But he asked us to clean the basement. And we said, okay, we'll get it done. Came back down to check. It wasn't clean. He said, you need to clean the basement. And we said, okay. Again, he come back down. It wasn't done. And he said, um, he said, if I have to come back down, I'm going to cut the cord to the TV if you don't clean this basement. And we didn't believe him, right? We thought we were being sneaky. So he walked upstairs. We turned the TV back on. But we didn't turn the volume down, you know. So um, within a few minutes, we could hear the heavy footsteps coming down the stairs. We hurried like little kids thinking we could quit, you know, turn the TV off real quick, thinking we could fool him. We noticed the wire cutter's hand, the wire cutters in his hand. And we pleaded with him not to cut the cord. We threw ourselves on the ground and begged him not to cut the cord. It didn't work. He looked us in the eye and gave us another lecture on responsibility and integrity and commitment. And when he finished, he cut the cord and we were devastated. The world as we knew it had ended and our lives were shattered. <laughs> Did we learn our lesson? No, not quite. Just like Margie said, you know, we were a bunch of rambunctious kids like they were and must have ran in the family. But instead of licking our wounds and cleaning the basement, we decided that it would be best to go outside and tell the world how terrible my dad was at the top of our lungs. And I'll never forget is his silhouette came shown through the door. And then at that point in time, we knew we had made a fatal error. <laughs> as we went, as he came out to the yard to gather his children, we thought running back into the basement was a good idea, but there was no escape route. We were trapped like raccoons in a cage and we awaited our punishment. With sore bottoms at the end of the night with four bottoms, we decided it best go ahead and clean the basement and go to bed. He could ask any of our friends growing up. Our dad could teach a master class on lecturing children. <laughs> but over time, those lessons began to sink in, and we now have those values instilled in us today. And those same values that we teach our children. It's uh, to compassion and love. <laughs> so my dad had a soft spot and welcomed anybody into his home. He treated all of our friends as his own with kindness and love. Our daughter was always open no matter what time it was. If you had a problem, an issue, didn't matter what it was, the door was open and you could come in and talk to dad. If he was not around, mom would fill in. Didn't matter what the issue was. There's only compassion and love in the home. 
Our home became a second home for many of our friends growing up. Many of those friends called my parents, mom and dad as well. For some of our friends, it became a primary home as they had no place to stay. He was able to see the struggle and despair and just wanted to help. Perhaps that stems from his childhood. So dad grew up with a rare disorder called hypoparathyroidism. It's a PTH uh, deficiency similar to type one diabetics with insulin. We lack the parathyroid hormone that regulates the calcium in our body. <laughs> Except when dad grew up, they didn't know what it was back then. All he knew that he was different. He was tired. He was fatigued. He lacked the strength to play outside with his friends and his siblings a lot of the times. So instead he turned to books and watching TV. The doctors told his parents that it was all in his head. It was psychosomatic. He's just crazy. They didn't have any idea. So dad grew up that way. He was finally diagnosed around 18, 20, 21, somewhere in that area. But he had no idea that he would pass this disorder onto his family or his children. And we all ended up with it eventually. But dad was on a mission for a better tomorrow. He heard the news of a new therapy that could potentially help. But they needed patients to complete the study. We had a family of boys, all of whom had hypoparathyroidism. So he signed us up. And we'd spend the next few years traveling back and forth to Washington, D.C., participating in a trial initiated by Dr. Karen Weiner. In the early 90s, we started the NIH PTH1234 replacement trial. For us, it was like going on vacation twice a year. We stayed at the Children's Inn and got to know many other children and families with hypoparathyroidism and other rare disorders from around the world. During our time at the, ch at the Children's Inn, my dad met this really special girl, Howard Ruth. They, interest, they instantly they formed a special bond. And at the end of the trial, she said she wished there was a way that we could all stay connected with everyone that we had met. I know that was the moment that my dad was inspired by God to bring together people diagnosed with hypoparathyroidism and he started making those connections. 1905 was the beginning of the, the Hypoparathyroidism Association. It was his compassion that saw tens of thousands of people struggling around the world that nobody knew about. People who were looking for answers that had eluded them for years. He had been in their shoes and he knew what it was like to be alone, struggling with something that nobody understood. For us boys, it was hard to share that compassion and empathy because we were not alone. We had each other. <laughs> but our family was a very rare exception to that rule. He started by writing a newsletter that was mailed out a few times a year. Members shared contact information and began to make those connections. He loved every one of them. With the help of mom, Julie, and Lorraine, they created another home. But this time, the home did not help. But this time, it was a home without walls. I recall the, the phone ringing all hours of the night by people he never met, but who needed his help. He would talk to them about their depression, their anxiety, help give treatment recommendations. He would speak to ER doctors that would listen to him. And he would literally save people's lives as they were sitting in ERs around the country with their calcium crashing. There was no limit to his compassion and love. He then started gathering the best doctors from around the world to advance the treatment therapies and education of hypoparathyroidism. He would travel to international conferences and give keynote speaks, talks. His vision changed how patients around the world with all forms of disease and ailments were treated. Until recently, the medical community really only focused on treating the root cause. They did not look at quality of life as a factor. They believed that if they could fix the underlying issues, then the patient would be healed, and then they could move on to the next. 
At one conference, I believe in Italy, in Florence, he was speaking, he was the keynote speaker. And he talked about how each person is unique, unique in disease, unique in symptoms, and had different quality of lives. People with the same people with the same disease would have varying quality of life issues. I've learned that no two people are the same. And quality of life must be considered when developing new therapies and treatments. This concept is simple, but it was not a priority to the medical community at the time. Word started to spread. Quality of life studies started to happen. Now drugs and therapies considered for approval have quality of life studies attached to them. As they, that's the hypoparathyroidism, we just recently met with the FDA and they want to know how people are doing. They want to know now how people are doing. And it's not just about the drugs or the new therapies. It's overall, what are we doing? How are we making your life better? How is this improving your overall life? Let's see where I'm at. <laughs> Anyways, my dad's faith and connection with God inspired him to do his work, and his commitment gave him the ability to keep going when things were hard. His integrity. Oh, I just skipped it back. Yeah. Okay. I was present at the 2008 Chicago conference when my parents stepped down from the association as president and vice president. After 23 years of service, I got to witness multitudes of people come to him with tears streaming down their face, thanking him for the work that he had done, and for never giving up, taking their calls, talking to the doctors. And getting them the information that they needed so that they can have a better life, literally saving their lives in some cases. And at the end, really creating a home without walls. My dad's faith and connection with God inspired him to do his inspired inspired him to do his work. And his commitment gave him the ability to keep going when things were hard. His integrity gave him the credibility and reputation needed to connect with doctors and researchers to change the medical landscape as we know it. Most of all, his love and compassion for his fellow man guided his mission. Currently, the association represents over 5,500 members from over 65 countries around the world. His legacy continues to live on. My dad is my hero. I would not be the husband, father, or man I am today. My grandma Sanders told him that you would really either be famous or infamous. It's up to you. Well, he's not famous in the usual terms, and most people have never heard of him heard of James Sanders, because his mission was never about himself. It was about serving God, serving family, and serving his fellow man. His legacy will continue to live on, reaching out and touching the lives of thousands of people, millions of people around the world that will never know his name. May we all strive to be more like him, grounded in faith, full of compassion and love, always willing to serve our fellow man, even when nobody is watching. I love you, Dad. Till we meet again. And I just want to say one person that exemplifies a lot of the things that he stood for. It's my younger brother, Aaron. He stood by in the last couple of years, carrying him to and from the, the front room to the bedroom, getting him to and from the doctor's appointments as he was not able to move. He had his strokes. There was one constant in my parents' life, and it was Aaron. And as you continue to serve mom, I want to thank you for all that you've done. It hasn't been perfect, but we could not have done it without you. And you, you're my hero as well. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.
Wow. Thank you, Soraya, for that piece. And thanks to my dad for his words about my grandfather. Um, today certainly has had a bittersweet feeling to it, at least for me. As we all spend time with each other, we reminisce about good memories we all have and share together. But with that comes a feeling of disparity. As I was searching for a scripture to share with you guys, I felt like I needed to match that feeling of bittersweet. Fear not even unto death, for in this world your joy is not full, but in for me your joy is full. Doctrine and Covenants 101 verse 36. On the surface of this excerpt, it says not to fear death, as with Christ my grandfather will be full of joy, continuing his work for the Lord. As we dwell just a little deeper in this text, we can see that Christ encourages the feeling of bittersweet. In the same way we must mourn, we must feel joy, that my grandfather is right where he needs to be. With Christ, we as family and friends absolutely need to realize that this is not goodbye. We will see him again, cracking his jokes and doing what he loves. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I have decided to read a very heartwarming poem, and it's called Come With Me. God saw you getting tired, and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, come to me. With, te with tearful eyes, we watched you suffer and saw you fade away. Although we loved you dearly, we could not make you stay. A golden heart stopped beating. Hard working hands are at rest. God broke our hearts to prove he only takes the best. It's lonesome here without you. We miss you more each day. Life doesn't seem the same since you've run away. When days are sad and lonely and everything goes wrong, we seem to hear you whisper, cheer up and carry on. Each time we see your picture, you seem to smile and say, don't cry. I mean, God's keeping, we'll meet you again someday. You never said I'm leaving. You never said goodbye. You were gone before we knew it, and only God knew why. A million times we needed you. A million times you cried. If love, again, if love alone could have saved you, you never would have died. In life, we loved you dearly. In death, we love you still, and our hearts you hold a place that no one could ever feel. It broke our hearts to lose you, but you didn't go alone. For part of us went with you the day God took you home. <laughs> and <laughs> the word of Jesus Christ, amen.
Thank you for coming. I'm Aaron, I'm the fourth son. And I'm gonna open up by uh, doing a quote from the song. When I first heard it, it just reminded me of that. If just one person believes in you, deep enough, strong enough, believes in you, hard enough and long enough, well, you know it, Someone else would think if he can do it, I can do it. That was uh, this one the music. That's from the Snoopy the musical. There's also one of uh, Jim Hansen's favorite songs. This being a Jim Hansen's, my dad loved the Muppets. He always he had all the movies. He always watched them. He grew up with it. Uh, we also grew up watching British comedy a lot, especially Monty Python. One of the times, uh, one of one the thing I was weird is like when he let us watch uh, Black, of, uh, Black of Brian, Meaning of Life, one of the more watching movies, and I was like, why is he letting us watch this? But you know, because he loves it. But uh, one uh, one story I want to uh, I want like to tell. When I was eight, I, I got really sick one week, and it got to the point my cancer level started to fall really low, and I was starting to have some uh, vocal seizures. Dad recognized that and rushed me to the hospital immediately. Uh, he had to argue with the he, he had to argue with the ER physician to get my blood work done. But later, later I found out I was pretty close to dying, and he saved my life. <laughs> Other times, when he first, uh, I was one of the first to sign when I, when I heard about the uh, protocol of the NIH. He asked me if I wanted to join when I signed up for it. I said yes. For two weeks, he went with he went, he stayed with him two weeks. We went with the New York City, and again uh, and into uh to Baltimore, Maryland. I can't I don't, I won't forget, ever forget those days in New York City. We went to New Jersey, saw my great aunt. We went to the Science Museum in New York. And went to the Science Museum, Ellis Island, and Statue of Liberty. Oh, that was great. He taught me how to take care of myself when we have to go back and I have to be alone. He told me I have to be brave, be mature, don't get into any trouble. So I did just that. Now and date, uh, The years flew by that I was doing this work. I helped out with the, with the organization. Volunteered a lot of times with working with computers, uh, mailing uh, was with database work and mailing out newsletters. I did all that. I was more than happy to do it. I knew what he was doing was, was going to change, change the lives of many people around the world. And I'm very glad he did that.
uh, when I was going, working on in college, he, he encouraged me to, to continue to go on, just do the best you can, finish up. When dad, when he started getting sick, I have to, I pretty much have to quit school. I have to stay by his side. I have to take care of him, stay away, take care of me. <laughs> take care of all our brothers. I think he was really proud of that. But deep down, one thing I want to do, I want to be really, I want that to be really proud of me and other things. Well, I want to be seen in graduate school, be the first in my family. But it just got to the point where we won't be able to see that. But even, even us, you let them out to that. He was so proud of me. I was able to take care of him and take care of mom. I was take care of things in the house, household. And I knew he was. These last few months were with artists. But I had to be there for him. I had to be there for mom. But more importantly for dad. You know, it's just one day he, just, he forgot who I was. And it really hurt. And I, I knew he was still, he still remember who I was, even though he couldn't say my name anymore. Back in December, you saw what he wanted to know what I was making. I was going to do a quilt. I showed him the quilt and his lights lit up and he shook his head yes. So I made it for him. I made that with all my heart. When I showed it to him, he, he was so happy. I was, I was glad to do that for him. Make something for him. To show how much I love them. And I was, I knew he was suffering. I knew what, in the last few days, he was in so much pain, so much suffering. But I'm glad he's able to go peacefully with no more pain. And I hope to see him again someday. I want to thank all of those who participated and brought the spirit into this funeral service. The musical numbers. The words that were said help me to know Jim better. And to me, it sounds like Jim was a real advocate, an advocate not for himself so much, but for his family and for those that were like him and for those who did not have an advocate themselves. During this Easter time, we celebrate the life and the resurrection of the ultimate advocate, even our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sounds to me like Jim worked hard to portray him. There may be some time here in the near future where you may feel some grief. You may feel this loss. You can ask yourself, what would Jim have me do? Because just because he's gone beyond this life, beyond the grave, 
and entered into a spiritual realm doesn't mean he's not still your advocate. Doesn't mean he's still not going to touch your heart. Does not mean he won't prick you a little bit and make you think, what would Jim have me do? You see, our Heavenly Father has a plan for us, a plan of salvation. Death is a part of that plan, and it's okay. It's difficult. Not meant to be easy, but it's part of the plan. And we will be together again. We are one great big eternal family. Our Father in heaven loves you as his children. He loves us. And he will show that by allowing us to be together again. I know this, and I hope I can share that just a little bit with you and give you the courage and the knowledge necessary to get you through the next little bit. I encourage you also to stay close together as a family. Check in on one another. We may not be able to do a lot of things physically or monetarily for one another, but we can encourage each other. I love your family. And it's my pleasure and my privilege to be here with you today. I know our Savior lives. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now have Ben provide us with the vocal solo. After which Jason Sanders will give us our benediction. My dad always liked to listen to me sing, practicing in the shower. Um, Janice over here would always comment it, hearing it from across the way. But one particular song my dad and my mom really liked and enjoyed listening to was Amazing Grace. Um, so I'll sing that for you guys and in his memory. So. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, tolls, and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we been here ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We know less days than to sing 
God's praise. Then when we first begun. Thank you, Dad. Cheers. See all the love that everybody had from I think my brothers and nieces and nephews for participating and all the stories of, of dad and the love that he had for all of us. And our eternal Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this day that we can have to honor the life and love of Jim Sanders, our dad and friend. Embrace him in thy holy arms and as he continues the work that he he started here on earth and uh, watch over us as we go through this this period of time where we can feel the love that he has for us and the love that thou has for us and as we leave here today guide us with safety that we can get to dad's resting place and in safety in safety and as we journey home to our our homes and that we can all travel and see you as well. And I pray for these things in the name of that beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Thank you.